We've been uh, talking about what Christians, for some amount of time, uh, have called the armor of God or spiritual warfare. This is at the end of the book of Ephesians, so I would invite you to join us there. And what we've been considering is that God has given to every one of His creatures, every single one of His human creatures, God has given to them, offered to them, all of the equipment they need to live a life that is consistent with the will of God, a life of joy, a life of meaning, a life of noble and steadfast suffering, a life that is described by the Apostle Paul as standing firm. Paul is using the language of um, warfare, which um, is used consistently at places in Scripture. That's not the only way to talk about the Christian life, certainly, but it's the way in this context that Paul is. So we're considering that he makes available to every, every human being, every creature that he has made, everyone that is made in his image, he gives to them what they need to be able to live a life that honors him, that they're able to stand in this life, to stand in the future judgment, to stand for all eternity. And yet, not many people choose to take up what God has offered to them. Um, Paul, in his language of warfare, makes the statement that the war isn't optional. I mean, the image that he uses is that you are born into a spiritually contested place. So as much as we lament and often groan about some of the most significant and difficult things in life, which I think um, are very often some of our own character failings as we navigate life, not just the abuses and the traumas that we experience from others or not just the fallenness of creation, um, like what is fundamentally wrong in the world is fundamentally inside of me and wrong in me. Though we would all rather wake up day after day to a holiday or a vacation or a life of peace and ease, that's just not in the cards. We don't get that choice. You live in a world that you didn't create, that is fallen, because though God is good and sovereign and all-powerful, He willfully created creatures that would have to choose to love Him. And so He permitted the evil one, the adversary, Satan, to undermine by his own lies and deception, God's good order and God's purpose and plan. Now, um, how you understand what's wrong with the world, if you're not a follower of Christ or don't embrace that the scriptures are the revealed will of God, you may have different reasons for why the world is so messed up. But the Bible says that reason is because there is an evil and a fallen one who deceives people from honoring God as God and tricks them into honoring themselves as God and then experiencing all manner of um, relational breakdown in discord both with God and with others. So in this fallen state, God offers armor for a battle that is given to everyone. And so we're considering in the book of Ephesians, what this armor is, and then how you put it on. So in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Paul reminds us, we've looked at this verse a number of times, it's good to reorient our thinking in this passage of Scripture, this is where he introduces the language of a battle. Finally, he says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So there is, in spiritual places, in the spiritual world that is all around us, there is a cosmic battle, an epic struggle between good and evil, except for it's not an even fight. God is all-powerful, the devil is a created being who is a fallen angel, but has significant authority and power in this life. And so he is seeking to rob life from people. Um, Jesus said he came to give life, says that the evil one has come to steal and to kill and to destroy. So there is a spiritual battle, but the place that the spiritual battle happens, it plays out in the physical world, right? Because you're a human being. You have 
a body. Your only participation in the spiritual world is through the body and the mind that God has given you. So it plays out in a physical place. The battle ultimately, Paul makes the argument back in the very first chapter of Ephesians, he makes the argument that the the battle is won in Jesus. Let me make this connection for you one more time and then we'll I want to help you understand the armor in a broader context. So he describes the the battle is against the the principalities. He uses multiple words for power, rulers against authorities, cosmic powers over this present darkness. Well, in the beginning, in chapter 1, he's making the argument that Jesus is the armor of God. Now, in chapter 1, he doesn't yet use the image of a battle, but the chapter 1 opens with these incredible blessings that are every child of God's, if they are in Christ. So the battle that wages, whether you like it or not, the armor for that battle is offered to you if you're a creature of God. If you're made in His image, the the armor is offered to you. The armor is the person of Jesus, and there are few who choose to put Him on. So at the very beginning of the book, He describes all that we have in Jesus. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before Him. If you have put on Christ, if you're in Christ, this is true of you. This is your identity. In love, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. That's Jesus. In Jesus, we have redemption through Jesus' blood, not your own, the forgiveness of your sins according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will according to who His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. Deep breath. That's not even the end of the sentence. One sentence from verse verse 3 to verse 14, all of this is Christ. This is the armor of God. Jesus. Jesus is the armor of God. So we're going to begin looking at the individual pieces of armor, but I cannot say it clearly enough. The the language of a battle, the language of the equipment of a soldier is one way to describe the entire Christian life. Jesus is the armor of God. You can no more put on one of the pieces of armor, then you can just one of the parts of Jesus. If you are in Christ, you have all of Jesus. Or if you aren't in Christ, you have none of Jesus. The armor is Jesus. When he says put on the armor of God, it's, it's a picture to put on Christ in all of these spiritual truths. Verse 15 of chapter 1, for this reason I've heard of your faith, your love toward all the saints, and then he prays for us that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Christ, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to what he has called you, the riches of his inheritance, the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might. The same words to describe the power of Jesus are the same words used to describe the spiritual forces that we fight against. To bring back to the reader's mind, Ephesians is just a letter. It takes 18-ish minutes to read out loud. We go through it piece by piece by piece, staring at the trees. Sometimes we lose the forest. If I just read this to you one time straight through and you were good listeners like people in the first century were because they're not so distracted by all these visual things, if you could really hear a story, really hear a letter, it's only 18 minutes. The words that he does used to describe the power of Jesus, that God has given Jesus the greatest power and placed him above all rulers, all authority, all dominion. When he comes to the end of the letter and he's talking about the armor of God, that our battle is not against the spiritual forces that are up here in the heavens, we're reminded, oh, Jesus is the one who's above all these. So our victory, our armor, is Jesus himself. There's a spiritual battle that we're not exempt from, but the battle is won in Christ. 
the battle plays out in the flesh and blood realities of life. If you have your Bible open, notice in chapter 5, the very things Paul has just finished talking about. The book ends talking about the armor of God, putting on Jesus. Immediately before that, he's talking about relationships in which we all find ourselves. Everybody in this room is accounted for. He speaks to husbands and wives about his design for relationships and marriage. Raise your hand if marriage is a piece of cake. You need no instructions to figure it out because every day is better than the one before and it's just awesome, awesome, awesome. I don't think so. He talks about the relationship between parents and kids. I mean, raise your hand if raising kids is the easiest thing you've ever done. Hmm. I mean, raise your hand. Young people, if you're like my parents are the world's greatest parents, I cannot even conceive of a better parent. I mean, my kids would say that, but they're not in the room, so... And then he speaks about employers and employees. Yeah, how easy is that relationship all the time? Spiritual warfare? If, if, if you picture spiritual warfare as happening in the heavenly places, inaccessible to you, you misunderstand the picture that Paul is saying. There is a spiritual war in the heavenly places. Your participation is it is in your marriage in your parenting, in your response to your parents, in your relationships at work. The spiritual realities play out in the physical world. This is where the battle is. Spiritual warfare is as practical and as immediate as how you relate to your spouse, how you relate to your parents, how you parent your kids, how you treat people that are under your authority at work, how you talk about your boss when you're at home and your boss can't hear you. All of these relationships, like where the rubber meets the road, we say, the nitty-gritty of life, this is where spiritual warfare plays out, which I think is appropriate on a day that we acknowledge and celebrate mothers. If you're a mom, like happy Mother's Day, there are few roles in life as significant as mothering. When you are a wise and sacrificial and noble woman mothering children, you are engaging successfully in spiritual warfare. This is how practical the teaching of Scripture is. The pieces of the armor that we're going to look at, there there's six of them. We'll look at one that's a, a belt, like into a belt this morning. All the pieces of armor are meant to be used together. They are Christ. They're one way to think of Christ. They are to be used in the here and now, in the nitty-gritty. Okay, so the battle is won by Jesus, but it plays out in the everyday relationships of life. The instruction, chapter 6, verse 13, is to stand firm. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand firm. Psalm 1 says, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. Paul prays other places in Ephesians that believers would stand firm in their faith. That's the instruction, to stand firm. And now the first piece of armor is verse 14. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. Having fastened on the belt. These words in Greek, that's the language of the New Testament, they're an idiom or an expression. Uh, A common idiom in our culture, when it's raining really, really hard outside, you might say, audience participation, it's raining. Mm -hmm. This is an expression Similarly, girding up your loins. Raise your hand if you grew up with any familiarity with the King James Bible. Gird up your loins, people. That's what this is saying. Gird them. Go ahead and gird them. Okay. Fist bump. Got my loins girded. Now what? 
Okay, so in the day in Ephesus, the city that this is written in through large parts of the Roman world, everybody wore big flowing gowns, kind of like dresses, kind of like robes, a lot of fabric, covers up your indecent parts, but lets the air flow, like really convenient, except for all kinds of things, like working, right? Men, you're not as familiar with this. I am not, but I've observed my wife wearing dresses many of times. They're not conducive for a whole lot of things that we would describe working. So no disrespect, ladies. I'm saying you cannot do a whole lot in a dress. I know you can. I know you can. I know you can. But there's a whole lot in life you can't do wearing a dress. We've all seen a woman wearing a dress who's got to put her knees together and bend down like in this incredibly awkward thing, trying to pick something up off the ground because a dress is not made for like really getting after it. Well, the men wear all these things too. So if you're like going to really get after it, you got to gird up your loins, which means you take all this fabric and you got to hike up your fabric. I mean, it's just, there's too much fabric there. You can't run with all that fabric around your knees. So they would take it and they would gird their loins. They would get the fabric up and they'd wrap it around themselves. You can watch a video of this online or watch a tutorial on essentially wrapping yourself in a diaper is what it kind of looks like to me. <laughs> but I probably have some bias. Well, if you had a belt, this is where the imagery of the Roman soldier comes in. They had a belt to accomplish this task because I'm not very experienced in warfare, but I imagine if I wore a toga out to the battle, while I'm engaged in battle, the last thing I want to have happen is for my slip to show, right? <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to have to oh, put this thing back in there. No, so they had a, a belt. A belt, it's a picture of preparedness. Get ready. So it's used many places in the scriptures. Here's a few examples of the same phrase, girding your loins, being used. It's used in 1 Kings. And the hand of Yahweh was on Elijah, and he gathered up his garment and ran. Job 38. Job is wanting to um, bring God to account. He's given God the business a little bit. God says to Job, dress for action like a man. He says to Job, gird your loins, son. Put your helmet on, son. You want to talk? You want to talk like men? Let's talk. Gird your loins and get your ears on. Proverbs 31, where wisdom is personified as a wonderful woman. She dresses herself with strength. She girds her loins with strength. She prepares herself with strength and makes her arms strong. Jesus used this idiom, Luke 12, stay dressed for action. This is all about being ready. You don't have the luxury of choosing if you want to engage in the spiritual battle. The spiritual battle wages and it affects you every day you get out of bed and even on the days you choose not to. The spiritual battle wages. So Paul's first instruction is to be ready. Be ready. Now, there's lots of ways. Find an image in your own life. The power of the imagery of the armor of God is Paul was taking something in common in every Roman citizen's experience. Everybody who lived under the authority of Rome knew what the soldiers were dressed like. Some have even suggested that when Paul, who was in prison, he references in Ephesians his chains, he may very well have been tied to a Roman soldier. Now, I don't imagine that Roman soldier was fully dressed in his battle regalia every day he went to the office, but everybody knew what the armor looked like. So what are, um, what's a physical object of readiness in your life that you could attach this image to? Because you're probably not anytime soon, I mean this in all seriousness, I mean, God forbid in our culture we know all too readily the presence of occupying soldiers in our own land. Maybe the day would come, it isn't now, but we have symbols of preparedness. What's one in your life? Because you're probably not going to see a Roman soldier. And you're probably not going to be girding your loins anytime soon. But you're going to get ready for stuff. Maybe you're someone who cannot face the day without a cup of coffee. And for you, to be ready for the day is to have a cup, have a cup of coffee. Um, uh, my father-in-law is a, a commercial electrician. He's got this awesome tool belt that has an incredible variety and number of tools. 
and he knows where all of them are. And if he's ever going to do a work project, belt goes on. That's where all the tools are. That's what you need to be ready. Now, my wife is a huge workout nut. So in order to work out, you cannot wear any old clothing. We all know that. You got to have special clothing. You got to get your workout gear on. If you're a runner, you put on running shoes. Nobody runs a marathon in flip-flops. You got to get ready. Um, maybe you, in your vocation, you have a particular uniform or a particular briefcase or a work bag. Uh, in my line of work, I have a work bag. That's what I call it. It lives in the closet at home. I can't go to work without my work bag. What is a symbol in your life that you could attach it to? It is a symbol of preparedness. It, it's permission to play and another manner of speaking. It's step one. It's the very beginning. If you are going to put on Christ, the first aspect that Paul draws our attention to is Readiness, being prepared for the battle, readiness with truth, he says. Verse 14, having fastened on the belt of truth. Truth is that which corresponds to reality. That which corresponds to reality. I don't say this arrogantly, but clearly and confidently. Reality, we can see it, we can touch it, we know what it is. In our culture, we are beginning to express absolute and utter nonsense that you can't even know what reality is anymore. I'm standing on a platform. It's made out of wood. It doesn't matter what you think it's made out of. It doesn't matter what your perspective is. It doesn't matter from where you sit. It might look shiny and you think it's metal. It's not. It's wood. And it's painted black. You can call it yellow, but it's black. I am real. My body is real. This is real. I, I, I correspond to reality. This is reality. Gird yourself. Gird your loins. Prepare yourself the very beginning of preparedness in the spiritual battle is truth. That which corresponds to reality. Our world would have you believe that reality is subjective. That whatever you believe about something is what makes it true. No! No, nobody practices that in math. And nobody practices that in medicine. You will not go to a heart doctor that does not understand the reality of how the human heart works. Not everybody is equally qualified to know how the human heart works. You better know the reality of it and be able to navigate the reality of it. Our world is tragically sowing confusion that you can even know basic reality. That's not a religious statement. I'm not making a faith statement. I'm affirming what for millennia was considered obvious. Okay, so there is reality. There is that which corresponds to reality. What doesn't correspond to the reality, we have to call something else. All right. We were, as a church, relatively familiar with girding your loins, the language of the King James Bible. Raise your hand now if you are familiar with the really cool goggles you can put on that we call virtual reality. Show of hands if you've done virtual reality. Why do we call it virtual reality? Because it's not reality. We have to call it another thing. And in all seriousness, I'm, I, mean, I mean it, praise God that we do. Because there are all kinds of other things with vocabulary in our culture that we have completely changed the name of stuff. Like, um, you can have almond milk. Milk is from a lactating mammal, not from an almond. But we call it almond milk, and we got all kinds of other milk that isn't actually milk. It, it's not reality. We should have given it a different name. At least with virtual reality, we're clear that there is reality and there's something virtual. If you are going to engage 
God's desire for you, if you want to experience life the way God designed it to be experienced, you must deal with reality the way that it is. And when you try to live your life outside of reality, come on, we have experienced enough of life to know that when you try to live life outside of that which is, You bring all kinds of heartache and despair and confusion on yourself and others. People who are confused about reality deserve much pity and much help dealing with reality. This is the very beginning, the belt of truth, that which corresponds to reality. I think in the the image of preparedness with a belt, I think there is something about a belt that holds everything together. The, The belt of the Roman soldier was what held all the equipment together. I think this is a good parallel for truth. Even a good belt, though in Ohio we got some pretty measly buckles. If you're from Texas, you know a thing about belt buckles. This is an Ohio belt buckle pathetic if you're a Texan, I imagine. But at least it does the job. Keeps the trousers up. Keeps us all together in here. I think this is picture. Truth holds everything together. So in Ephesians, I'll show this to you quickly. Truth comes from the outside, external to us, which is good news. Truth comes external to us. We hear it first, and then it takes root in us. We believe it if you're in Christ All get to hear the truth. Praise God for that. All must choose to believe the truth. When it's heard, when it's believed, then it begins to grow in us. And then when it grows in us, eventually it comes out of us. The truth is meant to hold everything together. If you want to know the power of Christ in your day-to-day life, if you want to see the power of Christ change your marriage, change your relationship with your kids, change how you approach work or how you exercise authority over others, well then, the the truth is where you begin. So, in Ephesians chapter 1, he says, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him. Now this all gets really practical, because we must be ready each day. We must roll out of bed and be ready to engage the spiritual world around us. The truth, we have to first hear it. It comes external to us. And this is incredibly good news for everybody because if the story that the Bible tells is true, that creation is fallen and corrupt, even our own hearts. So the prophet Jeremiah said, the heart is deceptive and wicked beyond cure. Who can even understand it? Meaning there is no heart surgeon alive that can understand rightly and see rightly and know how to fix the deepest problem. The truth is external. It's spoken to us by God. All can hear it. All can receive it. It's spoken over everyone. If you have never heard somebody tell you the good news that though you have lost your way in sin, there is a good God who made you and loved you and wants nothing more than to forgive you of your sin and reconcile reconcile you to himself. God has offered that to you. That's incredibly good news. You can't accomplish it for yourself, but it's offered to you in Jesus. The truth is spoken. It starts external to us, but then it has to take root in us. You have to believe it. So everybody in this room has now heard the truth. Probably wasn't the first time for most of you. Have you believed the truth? Have you internalized it and decided to orient your life around the truth? That you are made to live forever somewhere, and you will stand before your maker, and Jesus Christ is the only sufficient payment for sin, and his spirit is the only sufficient power to actually live a life of obedience before God. Do you believe that? When you hear it and you believe it, well then the truth begins to grow in you. So Paul describes this much in chapter four of Ephesians. That is not the way you learn Christ, he says, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him. Be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. The Apostle Paul says we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. Even Jesus, in his teaching about prayer, said we should ask the Father, give us this day our daily bread. Is the truth 
growing in you? Do you put yourself in a place for the truth to go deeper and deeper and produce in you? Are you spending time with God in his word? Do you talk with others about the truth? Is the truth growing in you? Don't just think Bible knowledge. Like, are you a person of integrity? Are you a person of truthfulness? Do you live consistent with reality financially? Do you live within your means? That's a practical way of living with integrity, living with reality, within reality. Is the truth growing in you? And then the truth comes out of you. We all know people like this, and they spur us on, and we respect them for it, that their life is so steeped with truth and truthfulness that it just comes out. Paul uses the language of speaking, and sometimes we do speak the truth. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. If you're going to know the power of Christ practically in your daily life, in your relationships, the first piece of armor, the first aspect of Christ to put on is truth. Now, I want to show you how truth, I think, how truth ties to all of the pieces of armor. This is absolutely foundational. Verse 14 of chapter 6, this is where he articulates the six pieces of the armor. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, you start with truth, that's right knowing, a knowing that is consistent with reality. What's righteousness? A right behavior, right living in accordance with reality. A life increasingly marked by obedience, a life increasingly formed by the truth is a life of righteousness as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Well, it is the truth. The gospel is the good news that Christ died for sins and was raised on the third day. This is the truth. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. What's faith? Being sure and confident of the truth. Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation, your deliverance in light of the truth. The truth has been spoken over you. You have heard the truth. You have believed the truth. You were delivered by that reality. That's salvation in the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the truth, praying at all times in the Spirit. Jesus described the Holy Spirit in John chapter 15 as the Spirit of truth, foundational to living a life that you're putting on Christ, a life to experience what God made you to experience, is the truth. It ties everything together. Get yourself ready with the truth to engage in the world that God has placed you in. Because the evil one is a liar. Many times we've considered recently Jesus' teaching on the evil one in John 8. Interestingly, the evil one is a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. You were designed by God to stand in the truth. The evil one will not stand in the truth. There's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks of his own character. He's a liar and the father of all lies. In Revelation, he's regarded as the deceiver of the whole world. Jesus is the armor of God. If you are going to live a life consistent with what God has designed you to have, well, then you have to put on Jesus. Part of the reason why this is such incredible news is because the strength of another is lent to us. Nobody becomes a follower of God in their own power. You can't. You can offer your own life in payment for your sin, but you're probably not going to be able to resurrect yourself. So that road probably leads to the grave. Jesus offers his life to you. You didn't begin in salvation. You didn't, you didn't make yourself born again. That's the power of Jesus. You don't continue with Jesus in your own power. 
This is the practical significance of Jesus is the armor. 700 years before Jesus walked the earth, the prophet Isaiah foretold that God, knowing that people could not do for themselves what was necessary to deal with the deepest problem of sin, like they, in, they invited the lie in and then couldn't get rid of it. You know how you've experienced this in your own life? One little lie turns into a slightly bigger lie and then a slightly bigger lie, and then now all of a sudden you're making up lies. You don't even remember what the truth is anymore. Well, this is what Adam and Eve did. On behalf of humanity, they bring lies into the world, and then they can't get it out. They can't see the way back into the light. God foresaw this seven centuries before Jesus comes. The prophet Isaiah foretells that one would come from God who would do for the people of God what they can't do for themselves. Chapter 11, verse 5, the prophet Isaiah says, Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, speaking of this warrior who would conquer evil and death, and faithfulness, the belt of his loins. Faithfulness is the exact same word as truth. Now, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, right? The New Testament is written in Greek. All the people in Ephesus, they're Greek speakers, presumably can't read Hebrew. So they're not reading Isaiah 11.5 in Hebrew, just like you don't or I do. They needed it in their own language. So the Greek copy of the Hebrew Bible is called the Septuagint. And the Greek translation of the Old Testament in Isaiah says that this one that would put on a belt, righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and truth the belt of his loins. 700 years before Jesus came. So when Jesus comes seven centuries later and announces, I am the way and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is the soldier, the warrior that was prophesied. And then now for us today, he is our armor. We don't have to fight. We can't fight in our own strength. So we put on readiness as the first piece, the first image. So, what symbol do you have in your life that is daily a symbol of readiness? Maybe you make the bed every day when you get up. More power to you if you do that. Maybe you start your day with a cup of coffee. And may God attach to your, to your literal, physical symbol a spiritual truth of readiness and preparedness. So when you're sipping on your cup of coffee to get ready for the day, then maybe you also say, God, feed me your word today. I need this coffee to be ready for my day. I need the truth to help me to be ready for reality. Maybe it's a certain outfit you wear, a certain way that you do things, a certain routine. I don't, we all get ready for things all the time. Do you get ready each day to engage the spiritual battle around you? Let me pray for us, and then we'll close our service uh, singing a, a blessing together. Father, praise to you that Jesus has done for us what we could not do. And thank you that you invite us to participate in him. And you make it um, practical and memorable, like a soldier putting on armor, or like a belt to get ready. Like, God, help us. Would you attach this spiritual reality to a physical reality in our lives, that we would be prepared each day with the truth that holds all things together. Thank you, Father, that you have spoken the truth over us, that you didn't send us out on a fruitless quest to find it ourselves or to find it deep within us, but you have spoken it over all of creation that all who would have ears to hear could receive the truth and believe it and grow in it and have it come out of them. God, you're so good. Thank you. Thank you for the truth. Thank you that you are truth and that we can orient our lives around you. We find true north around you. You're the anchor. You are our deep rooting Thank you, Father. May this word 
bear fruit in our lives. Help us to hear it and to believe it and to practice it. We pray together in Jesus' name and all God's people said together, amen. This has been a message from the chapel. Thanks for joining us today. For more information about the chapel or any of our campuses, including Akron, Green, Wadsworth, Kenmore, Cuyahoga Falls, Nordonia, and Medina, please go to our website at thechapel.life.